good afternoon or good afternoon good evening or maybe morning depends on where you are uh, welcome to our webinar today um reading to write effective research papers with Sprintel. we have Eche uh, that's gonna do a nice session and do a demo of uh, what Sprintel can do um before we kick off i'm just gonna quickly go through some um um housekeeping so um please do check your visual and audio settings if you cannot hear me um try to rejoin or uh, change those settings i am speaking <laughs> so you should hear me i'm also sharing my screen so you should be seeing that um please ask any questions in the q a box and uh, we will answer them at the end um if there are any sort of other questions i can uh, try and answer them as we go through um the webinar today and um, any questions that we don't answer we'll try to cover them in a in a follow-up blog and yes we will we are recording and we will be uh, sending a recording um i i did i do have here that it will be emailed tomorrow but that's very optimistic so <laughs> if we hit that target that would be amazing um but we'll uh, we'll definitely share those so um, before I um, I let Etcha take over, and as we're seeing more and more people coming in, um, we'll do a little warm up Mentimeter. Uh, use the QR code or the link, which I will also share uh, in the chat. Oops. So you should get the link now, and I'm going to move over to our mentee. So what are your favorite tools for gathering, reviewing uh, the literature, maybe writing? Okay, Google Scholar, yes, that's the go-to. Oh, still looking. Oh, Zotero. Okay, Citavi for citations as well. Uh, patterns. Oh, that's a new one. Um, if you're still looking, ask me. I can give you a whole list. <laughs> Handwriting. Okay. Um, Libra, University Library Research. Yes, that's a, a very uh, useful one. Research Rabbit. Obsidian. Yes, I've tried Obsidian. I never could work around it. Elicit is is amazing, yes. And they're integrating some AI stuff in there, which is making it even more useful. Um, EndNote, Evernote, um, Academic Search Complete, Mendeley Recommends, Google Scholars is very popular, I see. Okay. Um, right. Handwriting, NHS Library, PubMed, EBSCO. Those are all great uh, options. Semantic Scholar, has anyone used Semantic Scholar? Uh, also Cite. Great, okay, so we'll we'll go to our next question. Litmaps, Litmaps is, is pretty interesting. Um, sort of like a network of papers. Oh, someone put Scrintel, amazing. <laughs> Uh, cool. So we're going to go to our next um, question. What are you still finding quite hard to do when gathering, organizing, and reading your literature? Oh, Rome. That's, a <laughs> that's another tool. Using multiple apps. Yeah, lack of time. Lack of time is always a, a big challenge for sort of any project. Narrowing things down, uh, structuring, uh, retrieval, the volume of papers. Oh, yes. Uh, sorting the papers, going on rabbit holes. Yes, that always happens. <laughs> kind of keeping yourself on track with what you're trying to find out. But yes, sorting the literature and um structuring and identifying relevance quite quickly remembering okay um understanding the methods focusing understanding which ones are relevant um being sure and knowing you have all the literature yes 
connect the papers, to find connected papers, mind mapping. Absolutely. That, those are time-consuming activities <laughs> in doing literature reviews, reading all the papers. I wonder, uh, has, uh, ha has anyone on the call started using um, uh, all these AI-based uh, tools for summarizing and... Um, and maybe identifying or synthesizing some of the papers. All right. Thank you everyone for um, sharing your challenges uh, so far. Uh, I will hand over to, to Eches where I, I see we're kind of steady on the numbers right now. Um, yeah. And if you have any any questions, please do put them in the Q and A, and we'll take uh, we'll take them at the end. Okay, thank you very much, Daniela. Uh, I'm gonna start and like uh, share. Go ahead and share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Is everything fine? Yes. Uh, welcome, everyone. So this is Eje, and today I'm speaking like uh, as a former academic and also as the co-founder of Scrental. Uh, so I received my PhD in international relations from Stockholm University two years ago. And since then, I've been building Scrintle full time with six other colleagues of mine. And uh, like I started actually like having the I started thinking about the idea of Scrintle in my third year in the PhD. And my last year, to be fair, like uh, it was very hectic. I was uh, writing my thesis like from morning till noon and then from noon till the evening I was working on Sprintle, but I managed to finish on time. And the reason like I wanted to build a tool like Sprintle, I call it a super powered canvas basically, uh, was that like, I was writing like, I think my break point was that I was writing one article and I interviewed nearly 50 United Nations officials, like bureaucrats, uh, to write that article. And I felt really overwhelmed with all the information I had because um, like everyone's answers and all the other like small ideas or arguments were like colorful threads. And I felt like I was trying to wave a carpet with all those colorful threads. And I felt that like in order to do that, in a very smooth way. I need a tool that helps me brainstorm. I need a free structure, but then I need to organize my thoughts. So like all of those, like just whiteboard apps did not work for me because I needed much more text capability. And I needed like a smooth introduction, like smooth going uh, from brainstorming to structure. And that's why like uh, I built Sprintle actually. Uh, but today what we're going to talk about is uh, like, I'm going to introduce actually two different methods. Like we will be talking about uh, reading to write research papers. And this was a big problem of mine because I feel like it is the big problem for everyone, like writing. That was the most stressful period, not just for a PhD student and postdocs, even for the senior members of academia. And uh, like in my final years uh, of PhD, I got really into like writing and note taking part because I felt like it didn't need to be that stressful. And in this like, uh, like webinar, my main argument will be that writing does not follow and should not follow research, but it should be a medium of it. Uh, so we as scholars, like we need to uh, integrate writing to every part uh, of our research and especially to re reading. Uh, that's why we will be talking about uh, two different like uh, methods one, one is a method, one is a technique that I personally utilize quite a lot. And I actually kind of build a scrintle on top of one of them. Like that is Zetel Kastan. So we'll be talking about like Zetel Kastan and then pain mom technique. And it's not gonna be a tool demo, but of course like I'm using scrintle when I'm doing it, but it will be more focused on the method itself. And we will, uh, like, I'm very much looking forward to, like, hearing your questions on these methods or if you have any, uh, like, experience, like, utilizing them. Uh, let's discuss if it worked for you or not. Yeah, so, but before we jumped into the methods, like, uh, the first one will be Zetel Kastan. I will be showing you, like, step-by-step -step Zetel Kastan, like, 
how to actually do it like step by step because there is I think a lot of information about it but there is not so many exemplified demos about how to do Zetelkastan. And it looks like um, just an exotic word <laughs> with uh, yeah, people just fantasizing about it, but not actually doing it. But before we go to Zetelkastan and uh, Feynman method, like there is something we need, like there is a basis and that is note making. Like in order to do good Zetelkastan and utilize the Feynman method, you need to have the habit of note making. And why do I call it note making? Because it's not um, just um, like a passive uh, process of just note taking, but you actually need to summarize and record the information that you get from various sources and so that you actually incorporate your own ideas into the notes. So both of these techniques I think are actually built on this habit. Um, and that is something that we can all learn and like good note taking is not um, uh, it's not given from the day one but it is a habit that you can actually practice but okay so firstly let's start with Zetel Custom what it is and what are the steps and why do we call it Zetel Custom actually but let's start with like the definition uh, so Zetel Custom is a knowledge management method. It's a personal knowledge management method. So that's like quite important. Uh, so like people like try it, like there are uh, people who suggest that it can be done by hundreds of people. They can be shared Zetel Customs, but the like spark point of it is actually that it's personal. And it's a method for uh, thinking and writing. And it is a German word. And, uh, like <laughs> there are probably people who knows German uh, in the audience. And Zettel apparently means cards, like small index cards. And Zettel Kasten is actually a box of cards. So it is a system that you write your ideas or you take notes on uh, actually quite small index cards. And if you look at like Scrintle, if you look at like what I'm showing right now, these are also like small index cards. So we were uh, actually pretty um, inspired by that idea uh, that you should be writing your notes on smaller cards. Yeah, and then uh, the cards, like the idea is that all these smaller nodes should be useful in isolation. So there are like small Lego blocks or like uh, atomic units that all of them, uh, they can live on their own and you can just like uh, drag them and utilize them across different papers or across different projects. And there is also like another concept that is like quite vital. And these small nodes should be linked to each other, which we will learn like what does it mean to actually link cards with one another. And in this method, like uh, let's look at the history just a little bit. Uh, it was like born from a scholar uh, like us actually. And like Niklas from, uh, it was like developed by Niklas Luhmann and he was a sociologist and people who know him, like know him from his like enormous productivity. Uh, so he published like 58 books and more than like 600 articles, which is probably a dream. And that I never heard, uh, I've never met anyone who did that actually. And so he was known by like his super productivity. And he was very into like even the early days, like taking notes of the literature. But soon he realized that after he took a lot of notes that he didn't have a good system to keep track of them. And those notes just became uh, like meaningless if you can't use your notes, why you should take them. That's why he started like creating his own method of both like good note taking and also keeping track of them. So that's very important. We should be reusing like those notes. And he built like this, uh, firstly, four pillars of Zetel Kastan. So like uh, in a, like a, the reason we are having, we're making a Zetel Kastan is to actually uh, take all those four pillars. And the aim is to build our personal web of knowledge. So it's as if you're making your personal Google. And uh, like the next part is that we have to find connections among topics. So like you can think of it uh, as if you are making your own uh, like Wikipedia page and you should be linking to other bits of knowledge 
from that page so that your whole archive is actually navigatable. So if you land on one smaller small note, you can just click on its links, think of it like web links, and you can land onto a completely different topic, but maybe they are related in somehow. And the aim there is also to retrieve the right memory uh, whenever uh, you want to like start on a new project or a new paper, uh, like ZL Kastan should give you the ability to retrieve the right information from your own memory actually. And in the end, like uh, our aim is to be able to develop our own ideas and arguments from those smaller note cards uh, so that we can actually work on our next paper. But as I said, like the, in order to achieve these pillars, the first step is note making. And how do we do that? So the nice thing about the Talkastan that uh, it actually details pretty um, like comprehensively about how you should be taking notes. And there are four steps of taking notes. And we will be go going through like all of them and I'll be showing some examples of them. And then after like uh, we're done with that cast and I will move to the Feynman method, Feynman thinking, sorry. And the first part like uh, in that cast and like the first step uh, is that you should be making fleeting notes. So what does it mean? Like, uh, Think of it that like you're taking a walk or you're on your lunch break and an interesting idea comes to your mind. Uh, something that, oh, I should be like uh, maybe like reading more on different measurements along with Gini coefficient, I don't know. Or I should be reading that book. Uh, so the aim like uh, in this first step is that whatever comes to your mind, you should capture them. Because our minds, like we create so many ideas and like firstly, the first step is to actually capturing those ideas. And like what we should like be careful when we're taking fleeting notes is that like they shouldn't cause any distraction. So you should find the way that is really working for you when you're taking the fleeting notes. So you shouldn't like impose such a hard structure on yourself that is difficult to even like continue on the day seven. But it should be, can even be like a small notebook. It can even be like a, uh, like on your phone. Uh, the important part is that you put them in one place so that you can process them later on. And it should be easy. So let's look at like some examples of um, sleeping notes. And I personally like uh, keep, um, like I have a different board in Scrintel where I keep some of my sleeping notes. And I like, I don't like to create cards, for example. I like just create the like small text, text element like that. Uh, so that like they are not saved in my archive actually. They like, they are just like visually available for me on this board. And I like, these are of course some examples. <laughs> They're not like my real personal bleeding notes. Uh, but like, I simply like jot down my ideas. And sometimes I use like uh, color codes. So whenever I feel like, okay, like these two are more important than others, uh, I can just like change their color and let's make them uh, orange. And you can give like different colors or different emojis. And that kind of like helps me to sort out uh, what I want to do visually. But things like this, like uh, I should check this book. Can there be a correlation between Gini coefficient and violent? Just like, uh, thoughts that come to you are actually fleeting note uh, examples. And that is the first step uh, to Zetal Kazan to actually uh, like keep them because they are important. And then we have the second step, like, okay, you kept all of these like smaller ideas. Now what's going to happen? Uh, Zetal Kazan tells us that we should go back to these fleeting notes, uh, ideally every day, uh, or at least like some people do it every Sunday but you can do it maybe once in a couple of days. And you should pick out the ones that are important for you and you want to keep. So like, for example, if it can be an idea for your next paper, keep it there. If you like uh, take a look at it afterwards and feel like, no, this is not really important. You can actually delete that. So you should be keeping track of your uh, fleeting notes. But if there are some that you think, okay, this can be useful, then you should actually turn them literature notes. So what does it mean? Literature notes are the ones that uh, 
we take when we read or when we actually research. So those fleeting notes ideas can turn into your like literature review ideas maybe. And when we are like making literature notes or like reading notes, as I said, and the important part there is that you should keep it like pretty short, uh, but you should be quite selective. Uh, so if you're a person who is like writing a different note for every line of whatever you're reading, maybe they're not actual re reading notes. They are still fleeting notes probably. And you should be using your own words. So a simple copy paste uh, from an article that you're reading doesn't count as a literature note. And uh, like apart from these, uh, they should be, you should keep them close to your uh, source. So whenever you're reading your literature note again, you should be able to find like which book or which article that note is coming from. And I made like a couple examples for you here so that we understand better, like uh, what can they be? So here, like uh, I personally like to create like one card about each source that I'm reading. So this was an article, for example, and whenever like I'm reading uh, any articles, uh, like I like to keep literature note of the central concepts of the articles and some arguments, uh, main argument and also like side ar arguments. Uh, so the nice thing here is that like I can visually see, like I usually like put the source like somewhere center and then I like draw arrows uh, like from that source to the topic, like to the concepts or the arguments. And if you look at like my concept notes, uh, like I try to like write it as if like as if I'm kind of uh, explaining the concepts in my own words, rather than just like simply doing copy pasting. And like usually, I feel that uh, like it is very normal to take overly take like literature notes. And that's okay, because we will go through a third step that is like turning these literature notes into permanent notes. That's okay. Uh, but like I personally like to take notes of the main concepts and arguments. And I like it that like I can put them, uh, like I separate them like this, so they don't like live in a just a linear word doc. Uh, because when I have a look at the, an article like that, I can see that, okay, like these are, uh, like I can move them around as well. I can have the look that, okay, these are the main concepts and these are the main arguments. So like this type of visual working gives me an uh, overview effect and that I really enjoy actually, because when you have a complex topic at hand, you like your brain um, uses visuals so much better actually to give you a spatial understanding. And I sometimes like color code these cards as well uh, so that I have a, a better like way of organizing those totes. And then here I simply like put uh, another like uh, source and like the reason I, I, for example, here in this example that put those two sources next to each other was that like this article was talking about the concept contract and this article was also talking about the contract concept. And this way by just like clicking on the articles and making the arrows like light up, uh, having highlighted arrows, I can see uh, that like, for example, this contract concept is being mentioned by more than one article. So that's interesting for me if I want to write a literature review on them. And so another like example of uh, these smaller note cards is that, for example, if I'm writing about the concept delegation, I think it's a good practice to separate, uh, like to like put uh, the concept of delegation into different steps. For example, I think definition and like the aim of delegation are something different from each other. Uh, like I can be using the definition of delegation in one paper and the aim of delegation in another paper. That's why I separate them. Like the whole idea is to let's make Lego blocks that we can use to build Lego castles later on. Yeah, and here, like, I simply have a third article. And again, like, I can click on any of these cards uh, to see, like, uh, which are, like, uh, like, what are the notes that are linked to them and linked from them. 
And sometimes if I want to like have a better view of these cards, I can like open my, like I have a right sidebar here. So I can see like the different, if I click on different cards, I'm gonna be seeing their links here. So let's click on this one. And like the nice thing about this, like seeing the links is that um, like, I can, I'm not only focusing on that card, but after I read and digest that card, I can easily go to the relevant information, the next relevant information, because that's what like Zetel Kaplan is all about. Like you're building your own personal web. So you should like when you land on one website, uh, so to say, you should be able to like jump through other websites as well. So your whole uh, knowledge is always accessible to you. And so those were like the literature notes, but this is not the, or the reading notes, but this is not the last step. Like after you take these reading notes, uh, these notes go through another process and we have to make them permanent notes. That's the next step. And permanent, like terminal notes are the permanent notes are the final step in Zetel Kasten. And they're like, they are written in a very understandable way. So the aim is that if someone who uh, like has never read any other notes of yours, if they're reading just one note, they should understand what the main idea is. So you should be writing as if you're talking to someone else. And in making permanent notes, uh, like, we shouldn't be like focusing on the numbers. So it's the aim is not to collect as much as you can, but the aim is to like develop I arguments and ideas. So permanent notes are actually small, like ideas that you have that are read, like they're like ingredients that are ready to be uh, used for a cake, for example, that's <laughs> your research paper. And whenever you bring in a new permanent note into your system, you should be also like thinking about the links. Okay, I'm bringing a new information, but how does this new information contradict or assist like or support like another information that I already have? Uh, because if you think like that, you will be linking more. And that's the whole idea that your permanent notes uh, should be quite linked with each other. And let's look at like how to make them. And again, we are keeping the same principle, writing one idea per card. And we are writing as if we are writing for someone else. And we're using like full sentences, disclose our sources, uh, show references if we have any. And at this stage, if uh, you have still fleeting notes that are connected to these permanent notes, for example, yeah, is our is Gini coefficient and violence like um, like. I should be reading more about Gini coefficient and violence. Let's say that you read about it, you took reading notes, and then you started making permanent notes about it. Get rid of the fleeting notes about the Gini coefficient and violence. Just to, it's um, good practice to do housekeeping, basically. So that like your focus will always be on the next fleeting notes. Uh, so you are not like accumulating them. Yeah, and uh, like, and how to store them. Uh, I'm going to be also showing the examples right now. Um, so whenever like we make permanent notes, it is a good practice to link it with related notes, related sources or related like other ideas that you have uh, so that we make sure that permanent notes has entry points in our system. And that's important. So let's see like what I mean by entry points and what I mean by linking. So these are like some of my uh, like example uh, permanent notes. So for example, I like to again make like one card and that card says like these are my ideas for my uh, paper one. And I like to like link uh, different permanent notes to that card. And here, let's take a look at this one. Uh, in this permanent note, I'm basically like, I can close this one. Uh, I'm basically talking about like, uh, yeah, what it means to measure authority. And here, like you can see that uh, I both linked it to my paper one. So I kind of know that I'm gonna be using it in my paper one. I linked it to like another uh, permanent note that I have, and I also linked it to the source. So when I click on this um, permanent note, I can see that uh, I'm gonna be like 
using this probably for my paper one. And this is linked to the source. And I like, let's look at this one as well. Um, so I just like wrote about the, after reading all these three sources, whether this research on international organizations is generalizable or not. Uh, so I wrote like a small paragraph of it. So this is as in um, writing the small building blocks of my paper. So after like I took the reading notes, uh, as you can see per source, but when I jumped to the permanent notes, I started like uh, contrasting and comparing what I learned from all of these sources. And that's gonna be like a part in my like uh, theory section or in my literature review section of the new article. And then like after I read about like uh, these sources, I started having ideas about like the future research questions and like questions that needs to be explored that I felt like were not explored by these three articles. And again, I linked them to the source. So that like afterwards, uh, like it's gonna it's gonna be so much easier to actually when I write that, write uh, the outline of my paper, it will be much easier to uh, like just copy paste these ideas into my paper and reference them. So like the difference from uh, literature notes is that like these permanent notes you can actually build the outline of your paper with them. You can, if you want to do copy paste, you can do that because they're already written uh, in that manner, uh, so to say. And for example, um, as an example to store the notes, uh, I usually like make a board, uh, let's say like paper one, this is obviously like just an example. And I sometimes put like my fleeting notes, literature notes and permanent notes uh, in that board separately. So if I click on these fleeting notes, I will land into this like fleeting board, uh, fleeting note board that I already showed it to you. So it helps me like to build a structure and I like it. And if I, if you want to like link the boards with each other, link the boards to different ideas, you can do that as well. Okay, All right, let's go to like uh, what happens after you have permanent notes. And the aftermath is that uh, now we have like the first steps of a personal knowledge base. Uh, so we can actually use these permanent notes um, like to develop our uh, next projects. And like, it is a good thing to do, like to read all these permanent notes and see what is missing, what questions arise. And uh, like the whole idea here that whenever we write a new research paper, we don't start from scratch. So we go to our like uh, box of cards and we search for any developed idea that we already have. And we start writing our paper from there. Uh, I think like uh, when I was doing my PhD, uh, what I'm going to write about was taking the most of my time. Uh, I think that's true for everyone probably. Uh, so here the aim is that like you don't, you are not starting from a blank page. You already read like uh, hundreds of articles. You have a knowledge base. So let's utilize that. That's the whole aim. And that's what makes us more productive actually. And uh, yeah, it is like, as I said, the whole point is uh, make sure that these notes are reusable and resurfaceable. That's why we link things. So we have entry points. And also like apart from linking, using tags or keywords is also a practice that you can use. Okay. So for example, you can see that I use the tags at Alkastan here. And in screen to like whenever I click on tags, uh, I can see like uh, all the other cards with that tag as well. Uh, so it's nice to see the whole ecosystem. So I will, I can actually, uh, when I click on like international organizations, that tag, I can see all the other cards uh, and sources uh, like with that tag. Uh, so it is like, I think I find it quite useful uh, mm -hmm. not to work with um, like more rigid folder structure, but having tags, because if you use tags, you can have more than one tag for one card. So it can be Zetel Custom, an introduction tag, for example. 
so, but it is important to know like what type of tags you want to use. And the question that you should ask there is that in which context I want to use this. So I could have uh, like given the tag Sage webinar, for example, but like, do I really need a tag with Sage webinar? Not really, like I already have a board with that. And like boards uh, is good to have uh, when you have a project or presentation, I can make boards out of them, but tags should be like helping you to reuse the, those ideas. So next time I'm gonna be talking about Zetel Kassan again, uh, I can like just click on this tag, come across this small card, and I can simply use this card, let's say in a, another presentation. And that is useful because you can, uh, that means you can use your permanent notes, uh, like if you keep them more atomic in your papers versus in like uh, lecture presentations. Uh, so like, the best practice is to like think about which, in which context you want to come across that card and give the tags like that. And yeah, finding meaningful connections. This is like uh, the most um, like difficult part for many people. Um, like meaningful connections as in like when to draw the links, when do you know that you should draw the link? Uh, so you should be asking like these following questions like, uh, actually to the card that you have. Um, like, does this idea fit into anything that I already know? If it does, link it. So maybe they are related. And uh, like, can this, I can the idea that this card is talking about explained by something else? If it can be explained, if there is an uh, like an answer in your mind, then link it, uh, because later on you will be able to like find uh, land on one card, and then you will be able to find the other uh, linked card. And in the writing process, uh, like I usually look into like all the connections and information that I have and like simply like even like having the outline from my permanent notes, like just actually putting them in a structure, like, like turning that scattered information into a linear format. Sometimes it's enough uh, for me to create even a rough draft. Uh, so I always like try to look into um, like yeah, what I have already. Okay, so uh, I hope this was like a little bit useful. And uh, like I would love to explain more uh, on the Zetelkastan if you have any questions. And if, I think we will do it in the Q&A. Uh, but like I like the Zetelkastan method. It's a more comprehensive method. And then there is a Feynman technique actually that I want to talk about. And I think they are um, like not related, but if you use both, utilize both of them, I think they really help each other. Uh, so Feynman technique uh, was developed by uh, like a, a quantum me mechanics uh, physician, uh, Richard Feynman, and he was a Nobel Prize winner as well. And the very basic idea about this is that like you should be able to, like if you want to really know something, uh, you should be explained it as simply as possible. Uh, so the whole technique has, uh, let me extract this. The whole technique has like four steps. And that, that is to firstly, you choose a concept and then you teach the concept to yourself or someone else. And like whenever you feel like uh, you're not as simple enough or as not understandable enough, you have to go back to your source material. And the last step is to find like simplify even more and create analogies. So I try to use this like when I'm writing uh, both literature notes and also permanent notes, because sometimes like, uh, of course, as academics, not sometimes, but all the time, uh, the concepts that we come across or even the explanation style in the research articles are quite complex. But actually, in essence, they don't need to be there. They might be actually telling about a quite simple, uh, quite simple process, but they are explaining it in not so simple way. <laughs> But I feel like it is very useful uh, for me to actually use this Feynman technique for like I use it in two ways, like for the central uh, argue, central concepts that I know I'm going to be using in my paper. 
uh, and also form my own main argument. So I feel like whatever I'm writing about, I should be able to explain it very simply and across different difficulty levels. Um, only then I will know that uh, if I have, if I'm making a, a mistake in my like thinking, or only then I will be able to understand like if I'm making no sense at all. So the first thing you do actually is to choose a concept. So it can be like, uh, so you should start from small in the Feynman technique as well. It can be a, a theory or a, like a smaller or a concept in a theory, actually. Uh, they usually suggest a concept and like, so you start from small. Uh, so you're not explaining the universes, but just one thing. And here, like uh, for this like example, I actually chose a theory uh, like as an example, like democratic peace theory. And then the second step is that uh, you can start by teaching it to yourself uh, or like someone else, but you can like pretend to teach it. And the aim is to explain it as simply as possible. And there are like difficulty levels of teaching yourself or to someone else. So the first like difficulty level, if you're just starting, it says like uh, that just write a summary or notes and try to teach it to yourself or try to like speak to, about like that concept like or the theory like uh, among your friends or colleagues. And if you want to challenge yourself like even more, uh, you can start writing uh, like tweet, like Twitter uh, like or X threads about it uh, because like that information will be public. So you should like know what you're talking about probably. Or you can start like answering uh, questions on Quora about that topic if you want to challenge yourself. And the final level of challenge is like speaking at a conference or teaching. Uh, I'm sure like uh, many academics like encounter this. Sometimes you're teaching a new uh, like seminar and you might not be an expert of all the concepts in that seminar. But like teaching it actually to other students is probably like the technique says that it's the best way uh, for you to learn as well. And here, like you should be careful about not using any jargon and simplify it as like as much as possible. And I personally like uh, have it like three ways. Uh, when it's a new concept or a theory that I feel like, okay, I'm not 100% sure if I understood this, I try to explain it in three different levels. So the first one is like explain it as if you're talking to a six-year-old. And so here, like I try to explain the democratic peace theory as if I'm talking to a six-year-old. And the second one is like explain it to a university student. It's probably a university freshman or a sophomore, second year. They don't like it's their first time like uh, hearing about this concept, but they are around 18 years old as well. So they have more comprehension capabilities. And the final one is like explain it to an expert. And very usually uh, this is like explain it to an expert is the thing if it's your own article that you actually uh, input in your own article but I feel like if you don't like pass these two steps and especially if it's your own main argument in your article um, like sometimes you might be wrong and sometimes you might be not be saying where you are wrong and the third step is uh, like this actually steps tells you that it's not a linear thing so it's not that you pick the concept and then explain it uh, and then you're done but usually you will feel that you're not as simple as you want uh, to be so you should go back to your source again and here like as I said like I'm sometimes um, like embedding like pdfs here or sometimes if I want to work with web links I simply just like put the web link like on my board uh, so I see that like uh, and I can link that web link to, uh, let's say, like these cards. So I will be seeing that if I want to go back to my source, I can easily do that just by clicking on this link. And then the final step is like, sometimes your job is not done. You are not simple enough. Uh, so the technique tells us that simplify it further and use analogies and metaphors. 
uh, like especially it is good if you're at the first and second level, like explain it to a university student or a six-year-old. And you should repeat it until you're clear. Uh, so I think like sometimes academics feel like, okay, like my partner doesn't understand me. They're not working on the same topic. Uh, but if you're writing a new like paper, uh, maybe it's good to explain the main argument to your partner and see if it holds. <laughs> um, okay, so this is basically the Feynman technique. And I suggest that like incorporating this technique uh, into like making permanent notes uh, will give you a much clearer picture on what you are going to write about, uh, about your next paper and also much clearer picture in understanding the reading as well. Okay, but uh, I'm almost done actually. And I'm very looking forward to your question, questions. And like the main thing I want to tell about uh, both of these techniques is that like they get much better with practice. And these are just like ways of doing note taking. Some of them might not be working for you. Uh, it is like especially difficult for a beginner to keep one idea per card. That's the most common um, difficulty that people have, but it gets much better with practice. Uh, so you can receive help from people who are already using it. And I'm sure like in the end, you will find your own way as well. And there like, it's the main aim is not to keep perfect notes but the main aim is to be able to whenever you need to write a new a new paper or give a new presentation if your personal archive is something that you can look back on and draw some ideas I think that's good enough that's an amazing story yeah cool so I'm very looking forward to uh questions that you have great um thanks uh, thanks AJ um so to kick off a simple question um why the name scrintel yeah 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 that's <laughs> that's um i heard that question so many times and the reason for that is like when like the scrintel concept right now as you can see is very like um, it, it was quite difficult <laughs> uh, to think about this concept like from day one. So in the beginning, we actually had a different product. And that product was, again, focusing on extracting knowledge uh, from sources. But that time it was mainly from interviews. So we had the uh, transcription tool built in the Scrintel. So the name is actually uh, like merging of three words, transcribe, interviews, and an analyze. And then we changed the product uh, quite a lot, as you can see, but the name stuck. We just uh, keep kept using the name. Great. Uh, thank you. I hope that answers. Um, so there are a couple of questions around uh, comparing with other tools. So uh, yeah. someone mentioned memos and then um, uh, um, other title casting apps. So Rome Research mm -hmm. and Obsidian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Like the our idea here is that like we don't call ourselves as a text-based tool. Like we are visual first. Uh, if you are someone who wants to like uh, see see things visually, if you like to have a visual overview of things, then Scrintle is like a much better tool for you because in Rome or Obsidian, they're like firstly text-based and of course they create um, uh, like graph, they have a graph algorithm and they give you like, you can visualize your links, but you cannot customize anything. So in this way, like uh, with Scrintel, you can even create like tables, let's say, if you wanna, um, like if that's, what makes you happy, let's say. Like I can make a table, I can create boards and boards. Uh, so we have the same idea of bi-directional links, but we have a much like developed visual interface to that uh, because we just wanted to like make, we think like the process starts from brainstorming and we think tools should allow you to do that. Uh, excellent. And some some uh, logistical questions. For example, is mm -hmm. it compatible with Mac? And can you use your uh, pen, I guess, to to write? 
Mm -hmm. So like we have uh, both a Mac and a Windows app that you can download, but also we work on every browser. So right now I'm on my browser actually. And uh, so like for every computer, you can use it for iPads, like or any tablets. Uh, we don't have the app yet, but you can completely use it like by opening a browser and you can like move these cards uh, and also write on them with your Apple Pencil. Fantastic. Um, and okay, so biggest question or most common question is um, how much is the app? Do we just download it? Uh, how do we create an account? Yeah, so uh, right now, like we are in early access mode, like it is still an early product. And like we plan on like later on, we will have a free version. That's like our idea. But right now, like we don't have a free version. Uh, so right now it is like for annual usage, $60. So it covers like one year. Uh, but like if you're a student, we have 50% off just because I want to support students as well. And if you're a student coming from like developing countries, uh, you also will see a different pricing and a different currency. And for like uh, academics, we gave also like a 10% discount um, for the webinar. But like still, if... Like, please get in touch with me and I will do my best. Um, there's a, there's an interesting question here uh, mm. from Christoph. So the problem I always have with the atomic notes is that I easily end up duplicating them. Similar ideas arrive on different cards. Yeah. Um, at some point, everything becomes so confusing that I lose track yeah. of it all. How can this be prevented? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. Sometimes I have it as well. And what I do, like usually, which like that's why I like the uh, visual overview of Scrintle actually, I simply like open up my search and then I select like every card um, there is with um, like, let's say you're working on organizations that has organizations in it. And then I create a visual board out of it. Uh, that is like quite easy to do in Scrintle. So that way I will have, let's say, 20 cards that has the same keyword in it. And I kind of suspect that they might be about the same thing. So uh, like uh, if you have like 20 cards like on your board like that, uh, I usually like go in and check like what they are saying. I go in and like read and then I either merge or delete some of them. And that, like, that's why actually like we wanted to have the visual interface as well. Like if you took those notes in a, uh, like a more, just like a linear text format, uh, you will not have the chance to rip those like 50 pages and put them on a board visually. So you can uh, compare and contrast. So that's what I do. And I do it like regularly <laughs> or when I feel like, okay, I'm overloading. Excellent. Um, so there are some questions here around sources used. So can you have a sort of a list of all sources? So obviously you yeah. reference in every card, but is, is there a view where you can just see all the sources you've referenced? <sighs> Yeah, that's a good question. Like uh, right now we have it for, let me like uh, go here for web links actually, uh, but we don't have it for PDFs yet, but we will have it. And right now, like the nice thing uh, we have is that you can still like embed PDFs and we read PDFs in Scrintle, uh, but you don't have uh, all of my sources view, which like we want to bring actually. Excellent. Um, so um, a question from Carmen is, does it save papers and link the notes to them? Um, uh, she says that she has all her papers in Zotero. Can I transfer them mm -hmm. to Scrintal and use them to create a bibliography as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. That's what many people ask us, actually. Uh, so like if the like papers are in like, in any file mode actually, or in like web link, yes, you can like bring them to Squintle. And if you have your notes somewhere else, or if you have whole archive, let's say, uh, you can import your whole markdown archive to Squintle. And we will be making uh, like a different card per, per your documents. 
So if you're using like Notion, Obsidian or anything else, uh, you can try importing your whole archive. And right now, like also we are building a Readwise integration if anyone is using Readwise. Uh, so you will be able to see the Readwise highlights, but the next step is like making a public API. So you can, if you want to have an integration with Zotero and Mendeley. Oh, fantastic. Um, and so how about the, um, okay, so question from Randall. If you have a topic that has a lot of detail, do you create the yeah. structure first and then add cards or do you create the cards and then put them into a logical structure? Uh, you like the actually you should be just creating the cards <laughs> firstly like you should be more working bottom up than top down because you don't know like what the structure should be like um there like again if, if it has like a lot of details let's say you have this source and there are a lot of like concepts a lot of details uh just produce as much as you can and then do the um, organizing later on if you need organizing. Great. Um, not, not, not exactly related, but um, how do the arrows get created? Um, mm -hmm. As you create separate cards, do you make the link to other sources or does the tool do it for you? From yeah, good, good question. So you have two ways like to have uh, arrows. So you can either just like drag them like this visually and that's going to uh, create an arrow like to this card. But the nice thing here is that like whenever, even if visually I create an arrow, uh, if I'm reading these cards in like a document mode, I will be able to see their links here. So like the links are like they have a visual look, but they are not just visual. They are stored in my archive. So if I encounter this card, in a different board, like I can, for example, just like uh, select this card and put it in a different board, actually, I will be able to see the links. And you have like, that's one way. And there is like another way you can simply, when you're typing, um, just put your cursor, press plus, and then you can say new card, for example, and card, and you can create a new card. And that's gonna be linked. So you can either do it in text or uh, you can do it visually. And you can, um, I think there are some, a, a few questions around the, the different boards and cards. So can you link yeah. the cards across different boards? Yes, exactly. So let me um, delete this one. Yeah, for example, uh, yes, you can. So let's create a new board. So I can, let's say that uh, you're working on uh, like this article more and you can easily like create the new board out of this article. And now like you have a new board uh, only with these cards. But so these cards are a single entity. They are alive in this board. And if I change anything, like the content will change, but they also exist here. They're still here. Uh, like that was like a, a design philosophy decision that we made. Uh, so these boards are just a visual representation. You can reutilize the same information a different way. Like in the other board, for example, you can put them in a table, change the way that like they look, uh, but still they will be different. Like the same uh, cards and if you want like to um, like the nice thing with the links is that like I can simply remove this contract card uh, from the board let's say because in that context I don't want to see it like or it doesn't matter in that context uh, but just because I linked it uh, I can still like open this card and see all the links and I can still land into contract and bring it to my board if I want to um, excellent. Thank you so much, Ej. We we're running out of time, and the yeah. most asked question is if you will share the board. <laughs> yes, I, I can actually. So, uh, yeah, I can. And uh, like we can include can... it in the email in the follow up email. Yeah, it's gonna be just the URL link. You don't need to be a Sprintle user, and you will be able to see the uh, read only version, and you can interact with all the cards. 
Great, excellent. Thank you so much. We're we're out of time now, but thank you so much, uh, everyone, for thank attending you. and Edge for uh, an excellent demo of uh, all the features you've developed so far. Uh, really interesting. We will try to answer um, a few more of the questions in the follow up mm -hmm. blog. Uh, but if you have anything else, everyone, do send them through, and uh, we'll we'll forward them over to Edge. And Perfect. have a lovely thank rest of the day. And thank you. Thank again. you very much. Bye-bye.